Great. So, good morning, everybody. It is a pleasure to have with us today Sophia Stuber from Max Planck Institute of Astronomy in Heidelberg. Nice memories for me. And uh, as you see already the title, Sophia is doing her PhD thesis on a very, very interesting subject, not only for us here, for those of us who are working in uh, galactic dynamics and galactic morphology, but in general, uh, the morphology of the molecular gas can give answers to many open questions. Uh, it is a very interesting subject and we are very glad that you are with us today here, Sophia, and we are start listening to your talk. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you for the nice introduction. And of course, also thank you for inviting me to give this talk. So yeah, again, my name is Sophia Stuber. I'm a PhD student uh, working in the group of Eva Schinnerer at MPIA in Heidelberg. Um, and I want to say a couple things about this work first. So this is uh, this work that I'm going to present today is part of the thanks collaboration. So I just want to say a big thank you to all the people that are involved in this work as well. Um, so my work focuses on morphologies of nearby galaxies from thanks um, based on a molecular gas distribution. Um, but when I say morphologies, I think a lot of people can think of something different. So I want to briefly give you an outline uh, about what this talk is going to be about. So when I say morphologies, what I mean is features, morphological dynamical features such as bars and spiral arms. And this is on, also going to be the results that I'm presenting in the first part of this talk. But I'm also going to talk about bar lanes, um, also often known as, as dust lanes. Um, I'll talk a little bit briefly about gas flows, so inflows and also outflows that we see see in these galaxies. And last but not least, um, I'll say a couple of things about rings. But to start off, about half or even up to two thirds of galaxies in our nearby universe are assumed to host a stellar bar. And we also see that these stellar bar features are correlated with other galactic parameters. We see that the central gas concentration is enhanced in galaxies that have bars. The ages of stellar populations on bars are different, are older than in the surrounding disk region. And generally, um, we think that these bars are the main drivers, uh, the main mechanisms in the secular evolution of galaxies in our nearby universe. And let's say you, so it's really important to study these bar features. And if you have a galaxy, of course, you want to know if it has a bar. So let's say your supervisor assigned you a new galaxy, or you just found a nice galaxy that you want to study. So the first thing you want to know about this galaxy is, of course, does the galaxy have a bar? So what do you do? This can be quite easy. Of course, the first thing you probably will do is just have a look online. And there is a lot of catalogs out there that tell you typical classifications would be unbarred and SA classification, or whether your galaxy is barred would be an SB classification. And this even goes back to the very old Hubble sequence that was originally used. Um, but these kind of classifications have been expanded over the years. So there's also the intermediate bar classification and SAB classification. And other catalogs, they even use more classifications and S underscore AB, so an intermediate, intermediate bar or an intermediate strong bar. And if you get confused at one point about all these different kinds of classifications, uh, and this is not even all that is out there. Of course, there's a second option of what you can do. You can classify the galaxy that you want to use yourself. And there's nothing wrong with that because all these catalogs that are out in the literature are mainly based on visual classifications. So people having a look at images of galaxies, classifying what kind of bar class they see in these images. And of course, we are in the year 2023, machine learning is on the rise, um, but still most of these catalogs that we're using in the local universe or all the training data that we use for machine learning data sets are the visually based ones. So nothing wrong with doing that. But if you want to do that, you have to ask yourself a second question. What wavelengths should you use? What image should you look at? And um, so if there's a question, then please shout out. Um, because I can't read the comments right now, uh, just as a heads up. So why do we care about what wavelengths to use? So there is this idea out there that there is sort of a dependency from the morphology and how we perceive morphologies and the wavelengths that we use to look at it. One example is the so-called stronger bar effect. So it was found that if you classify bars based on Im images from the infrared, 
they tend to be classified in slightly stronger categories compared if you would use optical images. And also there is still sort of a discussion about bar fractions. Um, bar fractions based on infrared surveys tend to be higher than bar fractions uh, de uh, determined from optical image surveys. And of course, there's a lot more playing a role here, like um, the criteria for uh, the selection criteria for the galaxies or some, some other survey design. But there is still this idea that potentially some of um, the things that play a role here is that maybe bars are more easily perceived on infrared images compared to optical images. And most of these catalogs that we use are either infrared or optical data sets. So we see a difference even among these kind of wavelengths here, but both of them are mostly tracing the stellar distribution. But we know our galaxies are not just made out of stars. There's also a lot of gas and dust in these galaxies. So what about using, instead of using the stellar distribution, using the molecular gas distribution to classify morphologies um, like spiral arms or stellar bars in our galaxy? And let me rephrase this question. Why should we do that? Well, first of all, molecular gas, um, depending which molecule you use, but generally is quite dissipated. So it is able to react to changes in the gravitational potential quite well. Even more sudden changes, it does react quite, uh, quite fast. Generally, it's also the molecular gas disk is a pretty thin disk, so not compared to the stellar distribution where we can have quite some scale height. And the second part is that if we have a look at the famous baryon life cycle, um, so telling us that there is different phases of gas in our galaxies, we have the diffuse atomic gas, which can, in some parts of the galaxies, can cool down, build molecules. We have denser molecular gas, out of which then stars or star clusters form. And at the end of their lifetimes, these stars eject material back into the interstellar medium, uh, which can be then recycled over and over again. And if we now look at the molecular gas distribution, then we can notice that this is the part, this is the material out of which future stars are formed. It's the dense phase of the ISM, so the phase that can potentially tell us something about where future stars will form, just based on where we see this dense gas phase and where not. So by classifying um, the morphologies based on the molecular gas distribution, we are able to link the underlying gravitational potential with processes of star formation. That's the motivation behind this work, to actually do the classification, classify uh, images, um, molecular gas images, and see what morphologies we can find in them. And to do that, um, you can see already in the background the images that we were using, which is carbon monoxide, second most common molecule in our universe. The most um, common one, molecular hydrogen, is a symmetric molecule, it's quite hard to observe, so we usually use carbon monoxide. Rotational transition two to one, and what you see in the background are observations at roughly one arc second, which in these galaxies is roughly about 100 parsec resolution, observations with ALMA. And these galaxies, which are the ones that we use for this classification, they are part from the so-called FANG survey. So I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about this survey, this collaboration. Um, so in this FANGS collaboration, there's, of course, not only galaxies, there's also people. There's also a lot of astronomers here. Uh, just one of the photos from our last uh, team meeting this February uh, in Pasadena. Um, I think we're about 150 people by now, number also growing. Um, and yeah, so if you ever see somebody else give a talk about FANGS, then you have at least some of the faces in mind that are behind this work. And FANGS stands for Physics at High Angular Resolution in Nearby Galaxies. So the goal is to study the star formation, the physics of star formation, resolved in galaxies and also the dependence of dynamical larger scale features. So the survey is not necessarily looking how one individual star is forming. Also not how in one cloud several stars are forming, but rather how on kiloparsec scales stars are forming and how they are impacted by the larger scale dynamical features. And since one galaxy can always be an outlier, this is a sample of about 100 galaxies talking about a couple megaparsec distances here. And these galaxies um, have also some selection criteria. So if we have a look um, in our nearby universe, look at the global star formation rate of galaxies as a function of the stellar mass. 
then we can see that most galaxies clump together, forming this so-called main sequence of star forming galaxies. Of course, there's also starbursts, higher star formation rates, there's the Green Valley, which oh, Milky Way is also sort of part of, and there's also the red and dead. But if we want to understand the star formation in typical galaxies, then we want to use galaxies that are sort of associated with the main sequence. And this is exactly one of the selection criteria for Fang's galaxies. So star formation rate as a function of stellar mass. The gray points in the background are now from the Z0 MGS survey. So most of the nearby galaxies and the blue points are the Fang's Alma galaxies. So more or less on the main sequence. Um, and it's about, so I probably will always quote slightly different numbers. So in this survey, I'm using about 90 galaxies, but the number is always increasing uh, as people are looking in the archive for more and more images to use, more and more data sets to use. So apologies if I'm quoting 100 or 90 at some point. I think by now we're even at about 120 galaxies. So the number is still increasing. Um, and for a subset of galaxies, there's also observations with our telescope copes, um, with MUSE, for example, HST, uh, and the same galaxies that are observed with MUSE will be observed with the James Webb telescope. We, I think we have about half of them observed by now. Um, so the data is still incoming and is still being reduced, um, but soon we'll also have quite a nice data set of the James Webb images. The galaxies are all at distances roughly less than 30 megaparsec. So there we can actually get a good res resolution of about 100 parsecs. And they're all more or less face on, um, at least the selection criteria, but of course some of the numbers were updated later. Um, and why is this the case? So that we can actually uh, study the morphological structure so that we can see the inter-arm versus arm region, for example, which we cannot do if it is edge-on. So just to give you a couple of examples of these data sets. So there's just an example of one galaxy, NGC 628. Um, this is how the galaxy looks like uh, observed by HST. Here's the example with the H alpha image from Muse. And of course, I guess most of you have at one point seen an image of NGC 628 from the James Webb telescope. This is also part of the FANGS JWST survey. Um, I think there were a lot of papers about the bubbles in these galaxies. So of course, this is by now some of the nicest images that we can have of these galaxies with really good resolution and sensitivity. But again, data is still incoming. So this data set is not yet complete. And in my work, I'm focusing on the ALMA observations, molecular gas, carbon monoxide in these galaxies. And the full sample of 90 galaxies looks again like this, this nice gallery that we see here. Um, these are the galaxies that we were using, and these are also the images that we were using, basically. So to do our survey, to study the morphologies solely based on a molecular gas distribution, we now have our sample of galaxies. We have our data. What about the method? Well, we are sticking with a visual classification um, based on the classifications of 10 volunteering people from our collaboration. Of course, machine learning is on the rise. We might consider that in the future, but this kind of classification study has never been done based solely on the molecular gas distribution. So we have neither a good training set, nor, nor do we actually know what to expect. Um, do we actually, are we actually able to trace the features, the morphological features well? We don't really know. And especially since the molecular gas is quite a clumpy distribution, um, we just stick to a visual classification, but we said we want to have 10 people do the classification so that we actually get a good statistic in, in the end. So it's not just one person doing it, but 10 people um, that need to agree on certain features. And what we classified are the features that you can see on the left side of this plot. Um, so a bunch of different features, I'll go into them in a second in more detail. So first of all, I want to say a couple of things about um, outliers, because I get this, this question asked quite often, what about the outliers? Because these Fangs Armour galaxies are selected based on low inclination, main sequence, um, more or less face on. Um, but of course, in some cases later on, we found out that the actual inclination is different. So we actually have an edge on galaxy, um, or in some cases, the CO detection is just really not good. And we don't even know where the disk actually is. It just looks like noise. Of course, in these cases, we can't do a morphological classification. So we remove these kind of outliers from our survey. The next thing that we classified, of course, is the large features, bars and spiral arms. So now I'm going to talk about the results that we find for them in a little more detail. 
first of all, again, we don't really know what to expect from this clumpy molecular medium. That's why for the bars, we came up with three new features. A, meaning it's unbarred. B, meaning there's sort of this thick bar, the interbar region is not really cleared out. And C, meaning that there is either two nice bar lanes or dust lanes that connect maybe with the ring in the center, or the interbar region is nicely cleared out. Um, but again, um, the bars also, as we will see later, look a little bit different in the molecular gas medium compared to infrared images. So we can't really do a one-to-one -one comparison with literature studies, but we'll try later on and you'll see the results. And for the spiral arms, we stick with the usual classification. So if we have two arms, it's a grand design. If we have several arms, it's a multi-arm um, system. And if we only have arm segments, then it's a flocculent galaxy. And in case you were wondering about this S classification, uh, I think in about two to three galaxies, um, those are more or less could be considered early type galaxies that have a tiny molecular disk in the center. And basically this disk looks like a UFO. It's a completely smooth disk. And that's why we came up with this classification S, but this is about two or three galaxies so it's statistically not that bad. And the image that you can see in the background showing you not only um, how the molecular gas distribution looks like, but is also encoding the results from this classification. So on one side, you can see the bar classifications. So the galaxy colored in purple, whether it's barred, or in red, whether it's unbarred. And on the other hand side, it's the spiral arm classification. Whether it's a grand design in purple, multi-arm in yellow, flocculent in red, uh, and you can also note that there's a lot of galaxies colored in gray, labeled with no class. This is because, to remind you, we had 10 people do this classification. And we want to make sure that the features we're using in the later analysis are actually well detected. So we set a threshold that at least six to seven people need to agree on a certain feature so that we actually use it. So the galaxies in gray are either outliers where the disk is not clearly visible or the detection is not really good or these 10 people could not agree on a certain feature. So we threw them all out and only considered the morphologies where most people agree on. Okay, um, and what do we find? Well, of course, the first thing we can check is what about the main sequence? These galaxies are mainly selected to be more or less associated with the main sequence of star forming galaxies. So star formation rate as a function of stellar mass. And we can see if we look at the distribution of the bar classification, most of the unbarred galaxies in purple are at the lower stellar mass end compared to the barred galaxies in green in this spot. Also the same for the star formation rate. And this is in agreement with some studies out there in the literature, but not with all. So there's still an ongoing discussion here. If we have a look at the spiral arm classifications, we also see that the flocculent galaxies in purple are at the lower stellar mass end compared to the grand designs in orange at higher stellar mass also in agreement with some literature, literature studies. And of course, if both the spiral arms and the bars correlate with stellar mass, it is unsurprising that most of our grand design systems are in a galaxy that also hosts a bar, and most of the flocculent galaxies are in unbarred systems. And I could only find a pretty old study from 1982 that basically found the same thing. Um, but this is actually quite a recent topic. So I've been on a conference just in June in Granada in, um, in Spain, where we actually had a discussion um, if there could be a connection between bars and spiral arms. So some studies out there claim that potentially um, a bar, maybe via its quadrupole moment, could trigger the formation of spiral arms. Other studies, for example, from DS Gaffier 2019, um, they study the pitch angles of spiral arms and see if they can find a connection with bars and they couldn't find any. So maybe this is also just a coincidence. So this is still something uh, up to discussion. But our sample here from FANGS is probably not suitable to answer any of these open questions and discussions. Why? Well, because we have quite a low number of galaxies as you can see here in this plot. Um, and so talking about 100 galaxies, is not that much. And in the literature, there's, of course, studies based on, on the stellar distribution, so optical or infrared images with way more galaxies than we use. Um, so what we should, of course, do is compare these classification with literature classifications. All of them are nearby galaxies, so most of them have been classified and studied based on the stellar distribution. So this is what we're going to do next. 
Um, here you can see the confusion matrix comparing literature classifications, which are mainly used from Bhutan 2015 based on infrared images, or if not available, based on optical images from De Vaux Couleur 1995, compared to our thanks classification. And at first glance, it doesn't look too good, but let me get through this uh, in a little more detail. So let, let's start with the spiral arms because this is the easier one. Generally, we can see that on the diagonal, this sort of is a darker color to see. So the top left, for example, or the bottom right. And this is quite good. And since again, we've never done this kind of study based on molecular gas before. So we think this is actually quite a good agreement. So in most cases, we at least detect that if there is a spiral arm or not. Um, but we can of course see that the multi-arms did not seem to work too well. Um, but there's actually a couple of physical reasons why this could be the case. So potentially, um, we know that from some studies, the multi-arm galaxies have a reduced arm inter-arm contrast compared to grand design spiral arms, which might make it harder to spot the spiral arms um, in the clumpy molecular medium. Um, also, multi-arm designs tend to have tighter pitch angles, which might also make it hard, again, in a really clumpy distribution to see the spiral arms. Um, also, um, multi-arms have a smaller arm width, which also could mean that there's less gas accumulating on the arm if it's smaller. So it makes it also maybe harder to see in the molecular distribution compared to a grand design. And maybe also since the gas is responding to the underlying features, it could be that there is a multi-arm system, but two of the arms are stronger in the gravitational field. So in the, in the stellar distribution, you would notice, but maybe the gas is responding only to the strongest features. Um, and that's why we see a grand design uh, in case instead of a multi-arm feature. So we don't really know what is the reason here, but there's a couple of explanations. Uh, and depending on which galaxy, some seem more likely than the others. But of course, um, talking about the agreement, we also, of course, need to talk about the disagreement, the cases where we completely disagree with the literature. Uh, and I want to just highlight a couple of them. So in this example, there's four galaxies um, where basically the literature says there's a grand design spiral arm, and we say we don't see any spiral arm at all, which is quite suspicious. And looking at the, um, the distribution on the main sequence, these are also not really special. They are not really at, they're in the middle of the distribution. So they're not low mass galaxies or something. But if we now have a look at the images, it's quite easy to spot. So two examples, NGC 33, 51, and 45, 69. The top row showing the molecular gas distribution. The bottom runs uh, the 3.6 microns, so the infrared day images. And this gives us a hint about one of the major disadvantages of the molecular gas medium, the limited field of view. Because most of the molecular gas is mainly located in the central parts of the galaxies, our field of view is also only looking at these central parts. In at least a couple of cases, um, in I think three out of these four cases, we're pretty sure that it's just a limited field of view and we're just not able to detect spiral arms that are very far out in the disk. So if any of you ever wants to do a study based on molecular gas studying spiral arms, you of course need to be aware that some of these spiral arms can be really far out into the galaxy disk. Okay, let's go back from spiral arms and go to the bar classification. Let's look a little worse than the spiral arm classifications, but still we need to consider that the literature classification uses SA, SAB, SA underscore B and SB classes. They're completely different classifications from our ABC, so they're not meant to be one-to-one -one, uh, correlations. So we're actually quite happy if, for example, we detect the bar and it's also classified as SA underscore B or SAB in the literature because that means we detect that there is a clear sign of a bar. So generally, this also means that we have quite a, a good agreement. And again, this has never been done on the molecular gas distribution. So we think this is still pretty quite good. But of course, we do have some outliers, outliers that are pretty extreme. And I'm also going to talk about two of these outliers. So the first one is galaxies where the literature says there's a clear sign of a stellar bar, so an SB classification, but we do not see any sign of a bar in these galaxies. And if we go to the main sequence and look where these galaxies are located, and we see that they're sort of at the lowest stellar mass end of our distribution. And if you remember these, this nice trend that we saw in this plot, that we see that the bars are at higher stellar masses compared to the unbarred galaxies. 
well, if these six galaxies would be actually barred, we would not have this nice trend anymore. Then we just have a couple of galaxies. It's not like we have an incredibly huge sample, but these six galaxies could actually quite have an impact on these correlations that we see with the stellar mass. So let's have a look at how the images look like. So this is one example of 1559. Our top left is the molecular gas distribution, bottom left is 3.6 micron. And although in the 3.6 micron, you can see there's something elongated, which pretty much looks like a bar, we cannot see any signature of a bar in the molecular gas distribution. So these galaxies at the lower stellar masses, most of them also flocculent, they are pretty weird. And we don't exactly know what's going on here. Maybe it's gasless bars, at least in some of the cases, this is quite likely. Maybe there's star forming clumps that mimic elongated structures in the infrared and it's not actually a bar, but we don't know for sure. But what we know is that the galaxies at the lower stellar mass end are quite ambiguous. And this is something we really need to consider. Maybe the bars at the lower stellar masses, um, at least from our Fanks distribution at the lower stellar mass end, maybe they actually look different and behave different. And the physics is slightly different compared to bars at the higher stellar mass ends um, that we see. So if we want to do surveys and we include all kinds of stellar mass bins, we need to be aware that at least for these classifications at lower stellar masses, maybe there are some issues with them and maybe we should be really careful about them. And to emphasize this even more, we can have a look at the bar fraction. So in our sample of galaxies, we have a pretty low bar fraction. Um, so based on our molecular gas uh, classifications of about 45% which is pretty close to optical surveys that use similar galaxies. Um, so also about 44 to 47%. But if we now take the same galaxies from our sample and look at these literature classifications based on infrared or optical, then this would be 73% bar fraction, which is quite drastically different, which is really a problem here. So it's, it's of course these six galaxies, but not all these. There's also some SAB classifications, which we didn't get to see. Um, so just to give you an idea that these lower mass galaxies, they can make quite a trouble um, when analyzing bar fractions, bars in general. So we really should be careful about them. We also see in our sample of very few galaxies, a trend with stellar mass and increasing bar fraction with stellar mass and star formation rate. But again, these uh, classifications from the lower stellar mass end, if they would be different, we wouldn't see any of these trends anymore. Okay, one last outlier that I want to highlight is this here. So a galaxy, one single galaxy where the literature does not find any sign of a bar, but we see a clear sign of a bar in this galaxy. And this galaxy is also not too special. This is um, NGC 4941. And if you've never really looked at bars in the molecular gas distribution, you probably won't notice it. But if you have, like me, looked at bars based on a molecular gas distribution over and over again, there's one thing that you can clearly spot in this image. And this is, I highlighted it so that everybody can see it. There's two lanes connecting with the center. And this is a very clear uh, telltale, a, a very clear sign that there is a, a stellar bar in this, there's a molecular bar in this galaxy. And you cannot really see it from the other images because the center is just really, really bright in this galaxy. So it's a little hard to spot, but the molecular gas distribution clearly tells us there is a bar. And also the stellar light distribution um, classifications are quite inconclusive. So some say there is no bar, but others actually detected the bar and say that there is a bar. So it's, this galaxy is probably not the easiest one, um, but this gives us a hint about one of the major advantages from the molecular gas medium, which makes it pretty easy to spot some of the bars, and these are the bar lanes. This brings me now to the second part of the talk, talking about bar lanes, also often known as so-called dust lanes. So in a galaxy, what, what are bar lanes in the first place? Um, in a galaxy, um, the bars are made up of elongated orbits. We call them the X1 orbits. In the center, we can have these um, more or less perpendicular X2 orbits. Um, and while the stars more or less follow elliptical orbits, the gas gets shocked and funneled to the center along these orbits and can accumulate in a sort of ring in the center. So this is why we have these, this offset um, in these dust or bar lanes um, and connecting with the ring in the center. And just to give you examples of how this can look like, um, two galaxies, and you see 1097, 
basically looks pretty much like this comic uh, on the left side. So this is like the ideal case how we would think these bars should look like. But just the other example on the right, NGC 3351, shows us that yeah, they don't all look the same. And actually there is quite a variety of these bar lanes, how they look like in the molecular gas distribution. And therefore we also classified that. So we classified two things. The first one is the length of the bar lane, meaning how long is the molecular gas lane um, compared to the full um, size of the bar. So does the bar lane connect with outer features like spiral arms or rings, or does it end close to the center? Does it seize and there's a hole in between like we would have in the right case. And so we classified this as either long or short. So meaning how much um, gas is on the bar lanes, how continuous is this bar lane based on a molecular gas. And we also classified the curvature of these features by comparing it visually with images, with snapshots from simulations from Atinafula 1992. And since we are only talking about a couple of galaxies here, um, so about 20 galaxies, so the statistic is not too good. Um, so we also performed uh, some measurements. So we went into polar coordinates, the so radius as a function of the angle. We removed all um, features like spiral arms or the center. So these are marked in white here. So we removed them completely. And then we used exponential profiles to isolate the bar lanes. So those are the regions that are colored in this plot um, and had a look at the radial profile to see if we can actually confirm this being short or long um, that we see um, visually in these images. And this plot is now giving you the results. So on the x-axis, we, we have the measurement um, of the bar lane, whether the, it is short or long based on the molecular gas distribution. It is colored um, based on the visual classification. So blue means it's short, orange it's long. Um, and the opacity of the color indicates the agreement between these 10 peoples. So we want to trust the colors that are darker more than the colors that are really light. Um, and on the y-axis, we can see um, whether it's classified as being rather straight or more curved. And this is how the data looks like in this plot. So again, there's quite large uncertainties here. So the statistic is again, not too good, but we can see that first of all, the visual classification seems to agree with our measurements. The blue points are sort of more on the left side of the plot and the orange points are more on the right side of the plot, especially the darker ones. Um, and it seems that there's sort of two clusters in here. And what we find is that bar lanes that are shorter based in the molecular gas distribution tend to be more curved and bar lanes that are longer tend to be straighter in shape. And this correlation is also correlated with the global molecular gas mass fraction, meaning the more molecular gas there is available globally in a galaxy, the more gas sort of we see on the bars, the longer these bar lanes and the straighter they are. And of course, we also checked for bar strength. Um, this was also done by another study from Comoran two, uh, in 2009 based on dust lanes. There's only a really weak trend similar to what they find is more like a lack of data points. Basically, there's no bar that is strong and looks like the left case. Um, so there's really a weak correlation here to take this with a grain of salt. But what this tells us is that potentially with a larger number of galaxies and better statistics, uh, or maybe even with the James Webb images to be, have a better resolution or sensitivity, we might be able to say something, make conclusions about the bus strength or global parameters like the molecular gas mass fraction by simply having a look at the geometry of the bar. And this would be really great, but again, take this with a grain of salt, the statistics is not too good here. So we are, of course, trying to expand this in the future. Talking about these bar lanes, of course, these bar lanes do not only look nice and the geometry is quite interesting, but they also actually do something. They funnel gas to the center. So this brings me now to the third part of this talk, talking a little bit about gas flows. So first about inflows, but later also about outflows. And this is a study done by Matthias Omani, Ashley Barnes, Jai Sun and me. Um, actually trying to estimate how much gas is funneled along these bar lanes to the center. Um, and this is just done for one galaxy, NGC 1097, which is always the most beautiful bar lane case that we basically have here. 
Uh, and just using the ALMA distribution here, we can try to isolate them visually. Um, what is the, the gas that is on the bar lanes compared to gas that is in between and try to estimate the mass, but also the velocities to get an inflow rate. Um, and by doing that, you find that in this galaxy, there's an inflow rate of about three solar masses per year. The uncertainties are quite large, but still that this, this is quite a nice number. But does it actually tell us something? Does it actually mean something? Well, to do that, we can put it into perspective. We can ask the question if the mass budget adds up because we have gas being um, flowing into the center, being funneled to the center, but then we have some gas being consumed by star formation, being converted into stars. And the star formation rate in the central region is about two solar masses per year. But this is not the only thing. We also have some gas being uh, overshooting or just being flowing out again due to the starburst in the central ring. So we also have an outflow rate which is about 0.6 solar masses per year. And in this case, given of course the large uncertainties, this actually does that up quite nicely, but it's only one galaxy. So we plan on expanding this also to the rest of the galaxies that we have. So it should be between 10 and 20 galaxies where we might be able to do this kind of study to again, try to study if these masses, these mass floats add up. So if also the bar is able to sustain the star formation rate in the center, or if it will cease in the future, these are all things that we want to find out by doing this kind of thing. But talking about outflows from the center, I want to spend a couple of times working, work, uh, talking about one of my previous works, which is about outflows in the central part of our FANGS galaxies. Because we see that in this case, this mass budget adds nicely up because we have some inflow, we have some outflow, we have some star formation rate. But do all of the galaxies actually have galactic outflows? And if not, what kind of galaxies have these galactic outflows? And how much gas is outflowing of the center statistically in these galaxies? So this is one work we did in 2021. Um, so what is a galactic outflow if you want to detect it? It's a relatively small amount of mass moving at relatively high velocities. So we're looking for broad wings in a spectrum. Or if we take a position velocity diagram, we would expect sort of an S shape in there. So we're looking for something suspicious on top of that. Or we can take these broad wings from the spectrum, we can integrate over that and look where is the emission located with respect to a bar, for example, or other gas flows that we can have in the galaxies. And we did that for all FANGS galaxies. And we find that there is about 25% of the galaxies that show evidence for such outflow signatures. And we call them outflow candidates to be, because to be really entirely sure that those are actual outflows, you would have to do a little more. You have to basically do an individual galaxy analysis, look at each of these galaxies, model the velocity field, model the outflow to really find out what's going on. But this is not what we were aiming for. We wanted to have a statistical sense of how much gas is flowing out, how many galaxies have outflows. And so that's why we call them outflow candidates here. So about 25% of these galaxies. And we also estimated just in the central kiloparsec how much gas with the signature of flowing out, how much gas is that? Um, so we can estimate the outflow rates again. And in this part, you can see the outflow rates as a function of the global stellar mass, uh, global star formation rate of the galaxies. And then red um, and also the stars are the, are the points from FANGS, from our FANGS sample, so these 25%. And in blue are the uh, are points from a literature sample from FLUIS 2019. Most of the galaxies in this literature sample are starburst galaxies, so they have quite high star formation. But we can see that our data points from these main sequence galaxies actually pretty much extend to the lower range of this plot. So they pretty much show the same distribution than what we see in starburst galaxies. Here. So this is super interesting, and we also find that the, inf uh, the outflow rate is on average roughly the same as the global star formation rate in these galaxies. But again, it's also outflow candidates, so we didn't really model all velocity fields individually here. And we can also ask the question, 25, does this mean not all of our galaxies have outflows? So it might be especially interesting to check for these galaxies that don't have these outflows, if they're the mass budget adds up or not. So what kind of galaxies have an outflow? And we look at that, we can see that um, among these outflow candidates, about half of them have uh, an AGN in their center, which is 
a lot more than in the full fang sample, but still it's only half of them. So the AGN is not the main driving mechanisms for all of these outflows. But if we now have a look at the bar fraction, then we can see that nearly all of the galaxies where we have these outflow signatures, nearly all of them are barred, which is a lot uh, more than also for the full sample. Um, and also most of these outflow candidates are, the, are at a higher stellar mass than of our sample. So potentially this is just a coincidence. Maybe these outflows um, are larger at higher stellar masses so that we are able to detect them. The signatures are easier to detect. And coincidentally, also the bars are at higher stellar masses and it has nothing really to do with each other. But maybe it actually does have something to do with each other. Maybe the gas that is funneled to the center by the bars is necessary. So we need the bar so that we can have a, a central starburst ring that is able to drive the gas out again. So it could be one of the mechanisms to create these outflows. And B, of course, we need enough gas in the center so that we can create an outflow out of this gas. If we have no gas in the center, we cannot have a galactic outflow. So maybe there's a correlation here, just to emphasize again, how important it is to get the classifications of these bars right, to really um, yeah, find out if the galaxies have bars or not, because we actually see that there's a lot more depending on whether a galaxy is barred or not. Okay, talking about these gas reservoirs in the center brings me to the very last part of this talk. Give me one second. So um, talking about where the gas is funneling to or being removed from, from these central parts of galaxies, the last part is about bins. Um, generally, we think that the gas can um, sort of accumulate in resonances in galaxies, is some ideas might be associated these central rings with the inner Lindblad resonance. We can have covertation radii. We can have several resonances in our galaxies where rings can form. Um, and we classify that as well in our survey. So we classified whether we see central molecular rings. They are in the literature often called nuclear rings. Or we just because it doesn't really have something to do with the actual nucleus, we decided to change the name to central molecular rings, central rings. Um, so we classified that, but we also classified rings that are further out in the galaxies, for example, at the outer ends of a bar. And first, I'm going to talk about these, just a couple of statistics to give you an idea of what we have in our sample. About 8% of our thanks galaxies have these larger rings, so they are not in the center of the galaxies, and most of them are in barred galaxies, so they would correspond to, in the literature, often referred to as inner rings. Um, just a different uh, way to phrase these things, which is sort of in agreement with some studies uh, in the literature, but also not with all. But again, we need to um, consider that one of the major limitations of our survey is the field of view, which is not necessarily large enough to detect all kinds of rings. Also in the literature, we can have uh, the nuclear, nuclear rings, we can have inner rings, we can also have outer rings. Um, and very likely we didn't detect them, but we didn't distinguish between them. We just said, is there a ring or not? So it's a little hard to do a literature comparison here. But field of view, probably one of the major limitations here. Talking about these central rings, however, so in the centers of the galaxies, mostly in the centers of bars, we have about 30% of our galaxies that have these central rings in the center. And these images just show you how they look like. So they're often not really round, but rather elliptical or they can have all kinds of different shapes and how they look like. Um, most of these are in, in the centers of bars, which is what we would expect also from the literature, because just um, how the bars are made up, we have these X2 orbits in the center, and we can think that the gas is able to accumulate at these orbits. And one student from me, a bachelor student, Damian Gleis, uh, actually, probably right now, uh, looks into how much gas accumulates on the ring, trying to measure the amount of gas that is actually on these rings. Um, because we know that the star formation on these rings is pretty high. So although on the bar itself, on the bar lanes, there's not much happening, not many stars forming, once the gas reaches the ring in the center, it is able to form stars quite efficiently. Or does it? And that's exactly why we wanted to actually measure the amount of gas that is on these rings. Um, and so far, we found that on average, the mass of these rings is about 2.6 uh, to the power of eight solar masses and the average ring mass fraction. So the amount of gas that is on the ring, the amount of molecular gas on the ring compared to 
the, the amount of gas, molecular gas in the global disk, in the full disk, is about 6%. Um, which is also pretty similar to what we see in the Milky Way themes at, um, but he's still doing that right now. So these are still preliminary results. Um, so yeah, let's see um, what we find, uh, maybe in an updated version of this talk, if the results change or not. That brings me to my very last, um, well, second last slide, um, a couple, a, a small future outlook of what we are also gonna do in FANGS. Um, we have these measure, these images from James Webb, um, we have a couple of galaxies already observed. I think calibrations still ongoing, but it will be done at one point. Um, and um, Justus Neumann is uh, a postdoc here at MPA actually looking into these central rings based on the James Webb images, what he can see there. And of course, since the dust that we see in the James Webb images is able to shield the molecular gas so it can form, um, th therefore we expect to see similar structures. Um, and as we can see in the images in the background, we can see these bar lanes as well. So one of the goals is certainly also to, again, try to measure the geometries and shapes of these bar lanes based on the James Webb images. Although then we don't have a sample of 90 galaxies, but it'll be about 20 galaxies um, once um, all of this is completed. But just to give you sort of a future outlook of what we're still working on and what will come out of the survey. Um, and that brings me to my summary. I hope I could convince you that the molecular medium is able to trace morphological features. There are some disadvantages like the field of view, but generally most of the features can be quite detected in uh, the molecular medium. Um, and if not, then there's some interesting physical reasons why it's not the case. And especially for the low mass galaxies, we can see that there's something really weird going on with the bars and we should really be careful about classifications at the lower stellar mass ends um, of any kind of survey that we wanna do. Um, also, these bar lanes um, enable us, if we really are able to trace them nicely in the molecular gas medium, we're able to do some really interesting studies here to study these geometries and how they are connected with global parameters, but also study gas flows in and outwards of the central regions of galaxies. Um, and we saw that both central rings and galactic outflows are preferentially in galaxies with barred galaxies. Um, so we really need to get this morphological classifications right um, if we see these kind of correlations here. Um, and last, uh, lastly, I want to just say a couple of words that we actually started our own YouTube channel. The, you can see at the bottom, the Thanks Team YouTube channel. And you can actually find a 10 minute version of my talk, uh, of this paper of this publication. You can find that on our YouTube channel. Um, we started it quite recently, so we, I think we only have like be videos in there right now. But if you want to, just to advertise, um, hopefully we'll have more videos in the future. Um, and with that, I say thank you very much. And I hope you have some nice questions for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophia. Very, very interesting talk. A lot of information that we have to digest. Uh, there is time for questions from people in the, the audience here or if someone else wants. Uh, let me ask first one question. I find very interesting the correlation between uh, classification of bars and the shape of the dust lanes. Now, mm -hmm. is there any clear correlation between how much star formation one can observe ahead of the dust lanes in the sense of rotation and if the bar is barred or not barred? Uh, let me bring an example. If we look to M51, which is not barred, then there, there mm -hmm. are dust lanes. And ahead of the dust lanes, we see a lot of uh, newborn stars and star formation going on, etc. If we go, for instance, in 1097, we look to the straight dust lane shocks. Then ahead of the strat, uh, dust uh, lane shocks, we don't see, I think, much going on on uh, star formation. First of all, do you agree with the statement? Um, so for M51, I think the conclusion is that there actually is a, a bar in the center. No, 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 uh, I'm, I'm not sure. about the spirals yeah. outside, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, 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 okay. Ah, yeah, but M51 is interacting. So I think M51 is quite a special case because it's also asymmetric. Whatever, whatever grand design. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah okay, yeah. There's a grand design spiral ahead of the dust. We have strong dust lanes, mm -hmm. but ahead of those dust yeah. lanes, in these cases, we have a lot of uh, star formation edge to regions, uh, mm -hmm. all kind of new stuff. If we go in a bar 
and then we have dust lanes, the straight dust lanes. I put, yeah. uh, well, whatever, uh, 1300, whatever you want. Ahead of the dust lanes, we don't see so much star formation. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, yeah. So um, maybe, that, that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. maybe a criterion for distinguishing between um, BART and non-BART could be the amount of star formation that it is ahead of the dust lanes. Just an idea. I think yeah, yeah, but I think I think the problem is that these bars at the lower stellar mass end, they also don't form these nice dust lanes in the molecular gas. They are more like, yeah, sometimes we so we we, we still see some sort of lanes, but they're also it gets harder they're curved. to detect. They're curved. Them. they're curved, but they are strong, yeah. curved but strong. Not 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 necessarily the lowest. So these examples that I was showing, those do not really. So um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say which of the classifications are actually correct. There, there, so, is, there is an, yeah, an object yeah. that could be of interest for test of, of test case, 1566. Uh, mm -hmm. was the last. Okay, uh, if we forget about actually, the, okay, to the left, right? Yes, yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, let's forget about the bar in the very center, where it's uh -huh. a story, because I remember many years ago, we found with uh, Preben Groswold that in the near infrared, the, the bar is not where the end of the dust lens is but uh, uh, inclined for 45 degrees, but okay. I'm speaking about the the spirals, the main spirals, mm -hmm. and this galaxy has other spi another set of spirals further out. But here we have a lot of, of uh, uh, new stars, this pink stuff, it is, yeah. okay. So if we look in an optical image, the standard and the atlases, there, just behind this stuff, there is a strong dust lane. Now, mm -hmm. and if you look in the major image of this galaxy, this seems to be uh, like inscribed in uh, an oval, uh, in a grand design oval, let's say. In that case, mm -hmm. can you speak about a bar or it is a non bar galaxy? Forget about the central part. If there is a bar that ends, ah. yeah, you see, there is. I see. This, the same is, can be uh, said to many other grand design galaxies that have a small size bar, strong or not, is another issue. But if you look mm. in the middle uh, lower panel, then uh, who is this galaxy now? Thirteen hundred, or I don't. I think I think it's thirteen hundred. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Then ahead of the dust lanes, we don't see so much star formation. Mm -hmm. So this this is a difference between the uh, the dust lanes of the two objects, and that that's uh, uh, an idea. Maybe this can be used as a classification uh, criterion. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think, yeah, I think going into more into the multi wavelength regime uh, to to disentangle this. So, I mean, right now the study was either use completely only molecular gas or only infrared images. But I think, yeah, to, to really find out what's going on, you, we need to to add that up and use the multi wavelength data that we have. And I mean, and thanks, we already have some sort of data, but we didn't really combine it. So that would certainly be a super interesting next step to do to actually combine also these. Muse measurements, um, where we sort of have the star formation rate measurements. Um, yeah, that, that will probably be really helpful. Yeah, so we haven't we haven't done that yet, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. But it should probably be one of the next to be done. A second question. Uh, since there are now so nice uh, and high resolution images, uh, what about the very, very central part inside the molecular rings, the central molecular rings? And no, a question that uh, people working in modeling uh, the gas flow for years have is if one can see leading spiral features very close to the center, which is something that in uh, the, the standard models of bars who have two Lindblad resonances in an inner Lindblad, inner, in an inner, inner Lindblad resonance and outer inner Lindblad resonance then this should be expected and people suppress this by putting mm -hmm. a black hole at the center or other things. So do we see, uh, do we have the resolution or are uh, some studies that are looking for the very detailed uh, central region of these galaxies? And uh, do you, ha do you um, have in mind something like that? Yeah, yeah. so um, in fact, we don't have the resolution, unfortunately. So, I mean, 100 parsec is, is not enough if the rings partially only have a size of a couple hundred parsec. I think there was the NUGA survey. Mm -hmm. um, what was it stand for? Um, I just saw also this. Um, I think I think a nice thing, there was just recently a review by Francois Combs 
um, about uh, and, and she were, she was mentioning a lot of different different studies that look into that. So I think a big question is is uh, also do we do we need the spirals to transport gas? Is there other mechanisms? I think also Matthias Tomani just recently published a work on that, yeah. um, where he simulated these rings and trying to find out yeah what are the conditions that gas can be funneled further into the center. Because of course, there's not just the black hole, but it needs to be transported even further in. So I haven't heard about these second inner Lindbergh resonance before, so I don't know about that part. Um, but yeah, in our sample, we don't have the resolution right now to do that. But I think there's other really high resolution observations with ALMA. I think it was Nuga, but correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that had a look into that. Um, I don't remember all the results though. Um, but we, I think there was this idea coming from that we have these trailing um, spiral arms that further go in. There were some observations, I think. Um, I don't remember the galaxies, though. Okay, okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. So other questions are here. Yeah, please. Uh, have you found any correlations uh, between the mass of the bar and the different uh, structures, for example, uh, rings or spiral arms? For example, if we have a low mass uh, of the bar, we have rings, and if we have uh, um, uh, bigger mass of the bar of uh, spiral arms. The Have you heard the question, the uh, Sophia, is about the, the correlation between the mass of the bar and the appearance of the, the rings. Yeah, can you say um, that? Mirella has um, asking. Yes. A very good point. We haven't measured the, the masses of these bars. So I didn't look into that, but that sounds like a thing also to be done. Um, yeah, so we, yeah, we haven't measured that. Yeah. Okay. I, I think you, you can find a correlation of that kind. Um, uh, when we have rings and yes. uh, what is the, the amount of mass of the, the perturbation of the bar? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Go straight onto the to be done list. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I see a hand here. Uh, oh, no, 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 I don't see. It's not a hand. So let me see if there is somebody else who's, uh, who wants to ask something. No, no. So, uh, <laughs> Sophia, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It was a pleasure for us. Uh, I'm just stopping here the recording, and uh, but don't go away. Uh, stop recording, says he.